So hi everyone, thank you for joining me. Today we have Dr. Rick Ulig. Rich, Richard, Rich, which do you prefer? Rich, Rich is perfect. Rich. Uh, and he is the, I've got your full title here, Senior Fellow and Vice President in the Technology Systems Architecture and Client Group and the Director of Intel Labs. Yep, that's right, Director of Intel Labs, exactly, yeah. So um, Intel Labs, for those who don't know, is, is responsible for research and delivery of breakthrough innovations that reshape Intel's future in areas spanning computing, communications, security, and intelligent systems. I literally lifted that off the Intel website. I hope that's okay. <laughs> that's uh, pretty good. That that covers it. And I'm happy to say a little bit more about our history and our purpose. Yep. Um, so I'm going to start by you know, just talking about what Intel Labs is, because when I hear the word labs, as a chemist, I'm thinking something akin to white coats, safety spectacles, perhaps beakers of fluid <laughs> on the desk. Um, but as far as, you know, I can tell, Intel Labs is more akin to uh, Google's uh, or Alphabet's X company, you know, the kind of moonshot example where you're trying to find the next big innovations. Um, how close is that to what Intel Labs does and or how would you like to put Intel Labs in your own words? Yeah, no, you got it right. We um, are meant to explore the future for Intel and to uh, look at the sort of the disruptive technologies that could change um, the the way that the business you know uh, works in the future. So we are uh, not about those sort of uh, incremental advancements. We we're really trying to, to to look for moonshot or you know the things that move the needle for for the company by exploring new areas and um, and the scope you know is is really the everything from the circuits up. You know, we, we look at uh, circuit innovation at microarchitecture, at architecture. We look at um, system software, OS and, and virtual machine monitors. We look at programming systems. We look at emerging workloads and applications, and we look at how people use systems. Um, so we take that full stack view, and we have people that can, you know, that can um, uh, contribute in, in all of those areas as we seek out, uh, you know, possible um, disruptive innovation for for the company because the goals of Intel Labs focuses on you know those future generations of compute to solve the world's problems, new computational networking models and paradigms. Um, I would like to make it clear: Intel Labs isn't necessarily involved in developing next generation of Intel's manufacturing. Um, is that just a holistic split at the vision level of Intel Labs, or just you know dynamics of the company, or? Yeah, that's right. We we have our for process development, uh, what we call TD or technology development. Um, that there is a a research uh, um, organization that supports that uh, called Components Research. Intel Labs is not uh, is is a separate organization from that. Although of course we collaborate closely with them because there's oftentimes opportunity you know, at the intersection between process and circuits and you know the microarchitecture and architecture that you build on on that. But it's a it's organizationally it's separate from from what we look at. And for the sort of stuff Intel Labs does, being on the leading edge process node isn't necessarily always, you know, the requirement because it's that sort of long term vision. That's right. I mean, we do um, we do silicon prototypes, and we use Intel, you know, fabs for that. Um, but much of what we do doesn't even involve silicon prototyping at all. It may involve some new um, some software innovation. It may we may be in, you know putting together systems with uh, with other methods, you know, other uh, other ingredient. Uh, ingredients. It almost sounds as if Intel Labs is kind of a separate company to Intel, separate entity, albeit you know with access to manufacturing and such. Um, but I, I understand that Intel Labs now fits under Raja Kaduri's side of the organization. That's right. So how much autonomy does Intel Labs get, and is that the right amount of autonomy? Um, we have in our history, we've always had a, a good deal of autonomy, and that's that's by design. Uh, you know, we the, because our purpose is to uh, explore disruptive uh, technologies. Um, we're funded at the corporate level and in a in a manner that allows us to you know to select the um, the research bets that we think could could pay off and to take risks that you know that other parts of the company wouldn't do. Um, the the recent change where we became part of of Raj's organization. Um, it helps us though in that it creates new linkages into the the product teams and and the you know the engineering uh, organizations that that that, that Raja runs and so um, we still have our autonomy uh, to explore 
innovation, but we also have new pathways to, to transform the organization. And I would say that we, you know, Intel Labs has always um, organizationally had to fit somewhere inside the company, um, and and this this most recent move I think has been a really positive one. So, can you give us a sense of the scale of how big Intel Labs is? You know, budgets, employees, offices. I understand. You know, it's more of a worldwide thing, not just a Silicon Valley. Yeah, we're around about 700 researchers, you know, largely PhDs in, in those domains that I talked about at the beginning. You know, we cover everything from, you know, a lot up and down the stack. Uh, we're a worldwide organization, as you noted. So we have um, uh, labs in uh, on the West Coast and in, in Oregon and California, but we're also present in India, in China, in Germany, in Israel, in Mexico. Um, so th that worldwide footprint is important to how we do our work because we we don't just uh, do research inside the company we engage uh, academia you know we so, so this this allows us to, to be working closely and directly with uh, um, researchers at, at, at leading universities across the planet and also allows us to engage uh, different government agencies as well and and that and understand the the market specifics of, of each of those uh, geographies so that, that it's kind of important to our, our whole methodology. So as, as part of this upcoming Intel Labs event, um, the company is giving us some insights into uh, you know, five key areas that Intel Labs does. We've got um, silicon photonics, neuromorphic computing, quantum chemistry, security for federated learning, and machine programming. That's which right. Is, which, is, which is a mouthful. Um, I'm guessing each of these areas aren't simply 20% you know, of Intel Labs. Um, is there, is there, are there topics on that list? Uh, that aren't on the list that you would like to talk about, and can you give us a teaser? Yeah, sure. Well, it, you're right. That we had in the time that we have for for the labs, we had to be selective, and we're you know picking a few highlight areas. But um, it's certainly not the full scope of of what we do. Um, we, uh, you know, we we really cover. Um, a number of different areas. Uh, a big chunk of our investment is in new new compute models. Neuromorphic and quantum computing would be examples of that. But but we also just do core research in um, in accelerators for different kinds of specialization. You know, uh, of course, there's been a lot of focus in the industry towards improving the energy efficiency of, of AI algorithms, things like uh, deep neural networks, things like that. And and so we do research in in, in ways to improve those those kinds of workloads. Um, we we do work in in uh, storage and and memory technologies. We do work in, in novel sensing technologies, um, and we we look at, at connectivity technologies. In addition to silicon photonics, which is a connectivity technology, we we have uh, a substantial investment in wireless um, you know, millimeter wave communications, supporting five G and beyond. Um, and then we we also have a thrust in in um, ways to more efficiently program systems or design systems. So, you know, so we have a, a strategic CAD lab that does work in, in those areas, as well as um, just a, a, a general focus on, on trust, security, privacy research. So that, that's kind of the span of, of the areas that, that we look at. But you asked about previews for the things that we'll be talking at Intel Labs Day. Um, be happy to, you know, to go into any one of those. Yeah. Uh, I could start from the top on, on silicon photonics, it's, if you'd uh, like. I've, I've got a few specific questions to come to. On those, okay. uh, that I think we're, we're good, good to go through. But um, when you're saying about you know five G and millimeter wave, um, Intel sold obviously its modem business uh, to Apple over the last what 12, 18 months. Um, so when so when you say you're working on uh, millimeter wave, what what context is that in? If Intel no longer does modems, for example. Yeah, well, mo modems are the the endpoint, right? Uh, the thing that goes in the devices. But w Intel still has um, a huge bet on building out the five G infrastructure, and and that's um, you know you need <laughs> uh, uh, research and advanced technologies to succeed with with that kind of a strategy, and and that's really where the, our thrust is. Um, and it's not just on millimeter wave, but we're we're also looking at all the things that go into building radio access networks and. Um, and the, the the 
network infrastructure core, you know, so so as the, the big transition that's happening in the industry is we're going from purpose built, um, you know, networking gear to things that are, are based on more general purpose hardware, much like the transition that happened in cloud data centers. Um, it's a different kind of workload. It has to be optimized for in a different way, but we do a lot of work in, in that area, applying, you know, technologies that, that we've developed in, in the labs and, uh, you know, including things like virtualization. So network function virtualization would be an example of how, you know, we're contributing to that that opportunity for Intel. So it's on the infrastructure side as opposed to the, the modem endpoint. So so was Intel Labs involved in uh, Snow Ridge, which is the one of the 5G base station platforms, if I remember correctly? Yeah, we the, the research that we did in the labs in, in a mon- bunch of different areas, including network function virtualization and optimizing for, you know, baseband processing um, and, and, and things like that, which are uh, key technology ingredients for the Snow Ridge platform, uh, labs did contribute to that through the product teams. So that's an example of how we, you know, we interface with the product teams um, to, to bring things to market, although we don't, of course, the labs didn't directly deliver that platform. In in the list, you, you mentioned a lot of hardware things and then you know a few software things as well i mean speaking about virtualization uh what proportion of intel labs would you say is hardware versus software almost everything we do involves some kind of software even the hardware parts um so i would you know i'd venture to guess something like you know two-thirds is software to one-third hardware you know it depends on how you want to define we, we oftentimes don't think of ourselves as i'm a software person or a hardware person but rather i'm, I'm a systems person and so you know, so so we really believe in that multidisciplinary approach. Um, but uh, yeah, no, it makes sense. That's what I'd say. Um, how, how many of the projects at Intel Labs are necessarily non-public at any given time? Much of what we do is public. In fact, we publish a lot of our work, and um, when we're in a pre-competitive phase of the research, and um, and we view that that's important because we need to be at the you know the top of our game. We we need to. Um, make sure that the research is is um, relevant and competitive and stands up to the best you know research in the world. And so we we test ourselves that way by by publishing um, in the top conferences and venues. What can happen is, and we'll typically do that very quite freely at early stages of a research project. Once we decide that something is a, a an idea that we want to productize, it can go through a phase where we have to go silent. For a while, until until we're ready, you know, at the other end, uh, prior to a product or, or capability launch, that that we can be public again. So it, it's 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 oftentimes um, has to do just with the phase of the project that determines when we can speak about it externally. Um, so I've I've heard the term technology long range strategic planning in relation to Intel Labs as kind of like an event where new ideas are discussed. Is this how new seed projects inside Intel Labs are planted and perhaps you know where budgets and developments are discussed? It is one of the ways. So we um, we, we call it uh, affectionately T-SLURP, the Technology Strategic Long Range Planning. Um, and uh, it is a, it, you can think of it as a, as a place to sort of uh, crowdsource the best ideas, uh, um, technology ideas in the company. And it's something that Intel Labs administers or organizes organizes if you like but it's actually open to all technologists in the company and the way that we that we run it is it's a a yearly process and also something that runs throughout the year but we invite technologists to to make proposals about um, something that they think is important that the you know the, the the senior executives in the company should be paying attention to and then we run it through a development process where we you know really sort of kick the ideas around test them sort of challenge the you know the proposers in a way that that um, you know gets it uh, you know in a, in a form that, that that it can be uh, presented to the the leadership um, and then oftentimes you know the the what comes out of these uh, these t sort presentations is uh, a new uh, investment or new direction that the company may take, and and that's been true for you know a lot of the things that that have come out of out, both out of the labs or that that Intel's decided to to pursue. Would you say that Intel Labs gets enough funding from Big Intel? I mean, with the right projects, the right people, the right goal, would you expect you know billions of dollars to be poured into it, or would at that point it would perhaps graduate out into its own separate division? Mm-hmm. I think I think we have the right level of funding to do you know our mission, and when we um, w- which is to explore um, uh, you know 
possible investments that the larger Intel could make once you want to scale it. And so once we, we certainly we have sufficient funding for that exploration um, and we have to take things to a certain degree of maturity so we can have confidence that, that a given technology makes sense. At that point, we, we have mechanisms to, to, to transfer it to the larger execution machine of the company and, and then additional resources and, and funding goes into it at that point. That, that's basically how we scale the things is through partnership with the rest of the company when we get to that stage. It's worth noting that the neuromorphic computing division inside Intel Labs came through an acquisition into an asynchronous compute company. Uh, can you talk about how that process came about before you know the mergers and acquisitions team came in? Yeah, it's uh, um, the the talent from f uh, behind neuromorphic. Uh, they're they're experts in in asynchronous. Um, uh, design methodology, and um, that, that was from our Fulcrum acquisition. They were, you know, uh, a networking switch company, and they, asynchronous design was used in that switch. Um, but the leaders behind Neuromorphic are taking that that same design methodology and applying it to our, our Neuromorphic computing program, which is a completely different application of that 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 design style. Um, and, but it was, you know, it, it, it's a very interesting one, and uh, and now we're, you know, looking at, you know. Um, uh, sort, sort of different objectives with with that that work. I've heard that one vector of Intel Labs you like to promote is kind of like the program graduates. Um, it's not always that we hear about these, you know, in the context of Intel Labs. But are there, are there any highlights, um, you know, from Intel Labs that you like to mention? Yeah, sure. Um, some that would probably be familiar to many um, would be. USB, Thunderbolt, you know, we've done a lot of work in IO technologies, so, you know, um, Thunderbolt um, started as a vision inside the labs towards converging all the different IO connector types that we had on, you know, in the, on the PC platform years ago and, and just get them all onto a single connector and, and tunneled the, the protocols over the same link. And that was a combination of architectural innovation as well as uh, um, circuit and signaling technology that, that we brought together to, to make that, that case. So, so USB Thunderbolt, um, both of those are examples. Um, something that I personally worked on um, before I, I led the labs, uh, or before my current mission of leading labs is, is virtualization technology. So that, you know, I spent a good 15 years on that. Um, it goes all the way back to the late 90s when I started working on the, the very earliest um, proposals around, around virtualization and what we might do to our processors and platforms to make them more easily virtualized. And, and delivered multiple generations of, of Intel virtualization technology, or VT. Uh, so that would be a, an example. Um, silicon photonics, we, you know, that, that started in the labs also more than a decade ago, just doing the basic physics behind the different you know, ingredients that to, to build a silicon photonic solution, the hybrid laser, the um, silicon modulators, the waveguides, all, all of these things that, together with um, you know, packaging them together. And that worked for many years in the labs, and then it, you know, was transferred. Actually, created a brand new business unit that that Intel is now delivering uh, silicon photonic solutions in. Um, we we've done a lot of work in trusted execution environments. You know, building pl a place in the platform where you can um, run code in a in a secure way and in a, a testable way so that you know that you know what the uh, surrounding environment for that code is and so um, those were extensions to VT in, in the first instantiations of, of, tr of trusted execution environments but we uh, also did the work uh, around SGX which was a you know a, an architecture that came out of the lab so th those would be some some of the highlights you know off the top of my head um, are there any projects that had a major amazing potential but led to a dead end <laughs> Yeah, I think we, you know, we had a big thrust in um, wearables and, you know, really energy efficient endpoint devices uh, that we worked on. We, we were working on things like zero net energy um, uh, computing uh, devices that we thought would would have a lot of promise. Um, you know, the idea being that you would you could harvest energy from the environment and then continue just be able to run continuously. Um, and those. Uh, the technologies actually were quite interesting, and, and you know, from a from a uh, prototyping point of view, I think uh, it demonstrated it was a demonstrated success. But it was harder to figure out what the business behind that was, and you know, um, we as a result we sort of moved away um, from that. In, in part, I mean, the company itself also moved away from that 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 direction. So those would be examples of where it didn't pan out. So how, how much of your specific role is involved in you know locking down IP under Intel? You know, in, or ensuring you know that honest collaboration with academia and industry runs you know smoother than it. Mm -hmm. um, that's a great question. I mean, our one of our um, 
uh, important missions is to engage academia, and we have to do so on terms that that are are agreeable to them. And we um, oftentimes in that sort of that pre-competitive phase of research, we we do have a funding model where we say this is uh, open collaborative, which just means that. We're not expecting any IP rights or patents from the research that we're funding. In fact, we, we want you to publish. Um, we want you to um, uh, to do open source releases, you know, and sort of get, get the technology out there on the academic side. And, and we really, the only benefit that we get is we're close to the work as it's happening, and we have to pay attention <laughs> so that we can we can uh, pull those you know the, the, the technologies at, at some point, and then begin you know a process of practization. When that happens, when we do that transition, that's when we you know we'll, we'll start looking at different IP models, and we you know we'll we may be filing patents or or even just keeping trade secrets on on, on the further development that we do once we take it more you know, to, a, to an internal research development process. But that's kind of how we manage that tension. Um, we, we realize we have to take different different approaches based on, you know, the collaborations that are happening at any point in time. I mean, as far as I understand it, one of Intel Lab's perhaps biggest wide appeal public wins was enabling the late Stephen Hawking to communicate and access the internet. Yeah. Um, how has that technology evolved and where does that sit today? Is 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 that now beyond Intel Labs and it's just on it on its own thing or...? Yeah, so we um, um, that was work led by Lama Nachman and and her team, and the um, it's a great example of the multidisciplinary approach that we took because many others had tried to you know work on technologies um, for for Stephen Hawking that he rejected because you know they they just didn't fit with the way that he worked and his his expectations around that and so you know trying to fix like you know like a brain computer interface uh, uh, to him or, or things like that and and what what this team did is they really spent time with him understood wh how he worked and what he needed and based on that they developed the solutions so um, that's just a, a note on the methodology, but to answer your question, what's what's come of it? Um, we've that's an example of technology that we just uh, contributed into open source um, uh, as a, an assistive computing technology that can be used by you know other uh, disabled individuals and, and adapted for them. And so that's that's one way that that we're you know sort of carrying that work forward. I want to move into some sort of more of the research that Intel Labs is doing now. So, I mean, we've mentioned the silicon photonics already, and it's you know a slowly growing success story, being able to generate and process light in silicon, and it's mostly being used so far for networking. Uh, Intel's discussing millions of units sold, speeds up to 400 gig per sec, and networking engines. Um, as it sits now with a successful product and roadmap, um, it still appears under the Intel Labs umbrella rather than say networking solutions. Is that because there is still untapped potential? Yeah, well, we have a whole um, silicon photonics product division that delivers those products that you mentioned, and those are not in the Intel Labs umbrella, just to be clear. Um, but in because there are you know future generations of improvement possible, we have a parallel track where we continue to do research in, in the area. And um, to explain that further, the, you know, the, the Products we offer today are still discrete devices. They they sit outside of, of a CPU or a GPU or an FPGA. They're they're not um, integrated links into you know uh, the compute engines, and that's important because when you um, you think about the end to end path the data follows from from one compute engine to another, it's still at the endpoints. It still has to um, uh, follow a, an electrical link, even if it's a short one, even if it's just a few inches, uh, before you get to the, you know, the um, uh, the, the optical uh, device, uh, the transceiver. And so we, that, just that little few inches is where a lot of power still goes. In fact, if you, if you study the, you know, the power um, budget for, for a high-end compute engine, increasingly, just to feed the beast, more and more of the data is going to I/O power, and so what we're what we're exploring um, with our research is ways to to truly integrate uh, photonics, silicon photonics, into the package. And and we're there's a bunch of of innovation that's required to make that possible. The first is that you have to um, modulate, uh, find a different solution for modulation. So the, the modulators that, that go into the discrete devices, they're large, large um, devices. And we, we, we've we figured out how to build micro ring modulators that are much smaller in dimension. And we can, um, uh, not because they're smaller, we can array them around the shoreline of the, of the package. 
and um, we can run them at different wavelengths. And so now we can get much more bandwidth over the optical links. And, and that's what we call integrated photonics. And, and it's something that we think you know, will overcome that IO power wall and, and something that you know, we're really excited about. So it's all silicon photonics, but you've got the product team and then you've got integrated photonics, which is the Intel Lab stuff. Yeah, we're exploring the yeah we're exploring the, the the technologies, ingredient technologies to do the integrated photonics, and then w once we prove it out with research prototypes, we'll we will partner with with our uh, silicon photonics product division to to bring it to market at some point in the future. And there's you know to be clear, there's no plans for that today, but that's that's our methodology is that we you know we we closely um, collaborate with those the the, the product teams. On on the neuro, neuromorphic side of Intel Labs, you know, we're starting to see some products come to market. The Lohihi, the Loihi chip, I always mispronounce it. Um, Forty nanometer, hundred twenty thousand neurons. You know, scaling up to the whole Pohiki. Nah, excuse my <laughs> Pohiki yeah. Springs. Yeah, Pohiki Springs uh, with a uh, hundred million neurons. You know, three hundred watts. Intel even says that's roughly the equivalent of a hamster. Um, we're, see we're seeing the first agreements with like Sandia National Labs getting their own you know, 50 million neuron machine, scaling up to a billion or scaling up to 11 hamsters. Um, is, 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 is neuromorphic computing, can it simply be scaled like that, just add chips to add you know, more capability? Because in, you know, in traditional computing, scale out is often limited by interconnect speed. This is why we're putting so much money to interconnect. So, where is neuromorphic computing headed? And yeah, so uh, we're we're kind of exploring two broad um, application areas. The first is small configurations, maybe just a single low EE chip in an energy constrained environment where you want, may want to do um, some on the fly learning, you know, close to sensor data, and um, uh, you know, you might want to, for example, build a, a neuromorphic vision sensor, um, you know, and um, that, that's one, one application. Then the other, the other um, fork um, is to, to look at these bigger configurations where we're clustering together lots of low EHEs. And there you might be trying to solve a different problem like um, a, a constraint satisfaction problem or similarity search across a large data set. Those are the kinds of things that we, you know, would like to solve with that. Um, incidentally, we have a... Um, a what we call the neuromorphic research community, or INRC, that that is is that we collaborate with, as an example, where we work with academic researchers to in, in, enable them with these platforms to look at, at different areas. And we'll be talking about some of this at, at Intel Labs Day. But to answer your question, can we scale, or what are the limiters to you know to building the larger configurations? It's not so much an interconnect, like like you asked in your question. I, I think that's a matter of fabric design, and and we can figure that out. Probably the biggest issue right now is that the if you look inside a low EE chip, it's it, it's the logic of that helps you build the neuron model and run it efficiently as an event processing engine. But it's a lot of SRAM, and the SRAM is um, can be low power, but it's also expensive. <laughs> it, and so as you get you know really large clusters of of of, of uh, you know network together SRAM memory, it's it's an expensive system. And so we have to figure out how to um, we have to figure out that memory um, cost problem in order to to really be able to to justify these larger low EE configurations where you're you know amassing lots of, of that memory together in the same platform. So uh, you're talking cost simply as in dollars rather than say die area. Yeah, same thing really. I mean, it, it, it's it's a SRAM die area which is costly <laughs> and. Um, well, I mean, yeah. in, Intel has stacking technologies, for example, if you needed more, but that's expensive. It's expensive yet again. Yeah. yeah. It, yeah it, it's, however you slice it, it's going to be, it'll be costly on a cost, you know, per bit uh, perspective. It, and so that, that we have to overcome that in some, some way. Um, on the small side, you, you, you mentioned, say, vision engine processing. Um, so to put that into perspective, does that mean it could be used um, for, say, autonomous driving? Uh, it might be a um, a complement to the other kinds of sensors that we have in autonomous vehicles, right? We've got you know regular um, uh, um, you know RGB cameras that they're that are capturing you know capturing um, that form of, of input, but it's I think it's also been recognized that radar, lidar are useful in in autonomous vehicles. This could be another another sensor type 
And um, the, the basic argument for having more than one is redundancy, resiliency, you know, against possible um, failure or misperception of things. That just, you know, makes the system safer overall. So uh, short answer, yes, <laughs> there, there could be some application there. Um, one of the things with neuromorphic computing, because it's likened so much to brain processing, is, you know, the ability to detect smells. Um, but what I want to ask you is, what's the weirdest thing you've seen partners and developers do with the neuromorphic hardware? Which couldn't necessarily easily be done with conventional computing, I guess. Yeah, that, well, that's one of them. I think that's a favorite is, you know, uh, teaching a computer how to smell. So, so you, you already took my favorite example. But, <laughs> but um, the... I think it's um, it's it's quite interesting how the results that we're getting around problems like similarity search. You know, if you if you are are um, imagining you've got like a really massive vis uh, database of visual information and you want to find you know similar images and um, you know so things that look like a couch or uh, you know certain dimension or whatever. And um, being able to do that in a very energy efficient way is, is, is kind of interesting. That can also be done with classical methods, but, but that, that's a good one. Um, using it in control systems, you know, for like a, a robotic arm controller or other thing, I think those are, are interesting applications. We really are um, still at that exploratory stage to, to really understand what are the, the best ways that you could do stuff. But so, sometimes it's uh, like for control systems, you can you can solve them with classical methods, but it's just really um, energy consuming, and the the methods for training the system, you know, um, uh, make it less applicable in dynamically changing environments. And so we're we're trying to explore ways that that neuromorphic might be able to tackle those problems. I mean, uh, one of the examples you just mentioned is kind of like an image tag search. You know, something that's t typical machine learning might do. Um, or say even YouTube when it's looking for copyrighted audio and clips and stuff is is neuromorphic still applicable you know to that scale? Yeah, so I mean, just one one straightforward application for neuromorphic is that we we're we're looking at a um, uh, artificial neural networks like a DNN or a CNN, and um, that would be trained with a with a, a large data set and. Once it's been trained, we're transferring it over into a, um, a spiking neural network, an SNN, that's what uh, Loihi is, and then seeing if we can't, once trained, run the inference part of the task uh, more efficiently. And so that, that's like a really straightforward application. But one of the things that we're trying to explore from a research point of view with Loihi is how can it how can it learn with less data? How can it adapt more quickly without having to go back to the the this extensive training process where you you know run a large label data set against the the network um, before you can you know put it into into service? Now, brains take years to train using that method. Is, could, can Intel afford years to train a um, a neuromorphic a spiking neural network? Well, they, yeah, they do, um, and that, that I think that's one of the big questions. That's one of the big unanswered questions, actually, in AI. Right? Is is how do you how do you um, yeah biological brains um, they they experience the environment and they they, they learn continuously, and it, it can take years. But but even you know in the in the early stages, they they can do remarkable things. You know, like like a you know a child can um, see like a real cat. And then see a, um, a cartoon of a cat and generalize from those two those two examples with with very little extra training, right? So there's something that happens in in nat natural biological brains that we aren't able to to quite replicate, and you know that's one of the things that we're trying to explore. I should be really clear, we've not you know solved this, but that's one of the, one of the interesting questions we're we're trying to to understand. Um, as far as I understand, the, the Loihi chip is still a 2016 product, um, you know, just scaled out into more systems now. Uh, are, the future, are there future hardware development plans, or is the work today just primarily on the software side? Yeah, we are. We're doing another design, and, you know, we'll, you'll be hearing more about that in, in the future. Um, but so we haven't stopped on, on the hardware side because uh, we because we've we've learned a lot from the you know the the current design and, and trying to incorporate that into another one um, at the same time I would say that 
you know, we, we really are trying to focus on what is it good for? What are the applications that make the most sense? And and that's why we have this methodology of, of getting working systems out in the hands of, of researchers in, in the field. And um, and I think that's a really important aspect of, of the work. So it is more that workload app, uh, exploration, software development, I think is, you know, is really where we're trying to emphasize our efforts right now. I want to move on to quantum. I'm conscious of time. Um, but on, on, on the quantum side of Intel Labs, um, the focus has been primarily on spin cubic technology rather than other sorts of qubits. Um, is, is that simply a function of Intel's manufacturing expertise or uh, or from Intel's perspective, you know, are spin qubits where the future of quantum computing is, go is going? Mm -hmm. Well, we um, when we started our quantum program, we... We decided to uh, to look at both um, spin qubits, uh, the quantum dot uh, spin qubits, as well as transmon superconducting qubits. So we we had a bet on on both. Um, we decided to focus on spin after that the first few years of investigation because we we're trying to look forward to what what has to happen in order to to build a truly practical quantum system and you have to be able to scale to, to really large numbers of qubits. You have to get to, you know, not just to hundreds or thousands, but probably millions of qubits that are that also are um, fault tolerant. You know, they have quantum error correcting codes that work and, and you know, over them, which means you need many more physical qubits than you have logical qubits, right? So you got to get to millions. And if you're going to get to millions, you can't have qubits that are big. <laughs> it's, it's almost like, you know, like you can't have... Um, like vacuum tube, you know, based, you know, uh, computing systems, you know, that you're going to be limited in how, how, how much you can do. And so, so, so that was one, one thing that, that we figured out, but it, it's not just the selection of the qubit um, uh, for that reason. It's because, yeah, it, it aligns to our, our core competence that we're, we're able to build these devices, you know, in small dimension and at scale and, and it does align to, you know, sort of a core competence that the, the company has. But getting to scale is going to require other solutions. I mean, we have to figure out how to, how to control the qubits. That's where Horse Ridge comes in. And, you know, uh, being able to, because these qubits run at very low temperature, you have to have the control electronics run at very low temperature as well. And so that's needed. And if you can't do that, then you've got, you know, lots of, of uh, bulky coax cables coming from room temperature into the into the dilution fridge. And, and that's, that's not going to scale either. You can see quickly, you can't have millions of qubits controlled in that way. Um, and so, yeah, so these are the kinds of, of things that drive our, our decisions are mainly what do we have to do, what problems do we have to solve so that we can get to a, a million qubits um, at, at some point in the future. Um, I mean, when you look at those dilution chambers, they all look impressive when you take the covers off with all you know thin tubes and how it looks like a chandelier. Um, so to that extent, would you say that quantum computing has the biggest R&D budget in Intel Labs? Uh, no, actually, it doesn't. Uh, no. You know, it, yeah, we, we're able to do a lot with um, with relatively modest investment, I would say. You know, because we're um, and, and it's definitely not the the bulk of our investment at all. You know, those fridges do cost a lot, but it's it's not where the bulk of the money goes. Yeah. Um, Intel's current materials state that the commercial phase for quantum computing sits at you know twenty twenty five and beyond. Um, whatever that means. So sitting where we are today, you know, at the end of 2020 into 2021, is is that still the goal for the you know commercialization process? We're still looking at 2025. Should we be thinking another five years out? Yeah, I mean, we, we this is a we always talk about this as a 10 year journey, and we you know we still um, I think it's a bit early to be talking about prioritization um, at, at this stage. You know, you're even picking a date. There's still some fundamental um, science and engineering problems that have to be solved before we would we would pick a date, and so um, you know th th you could ask questions around when is it time to start engaging the uh, the ecosystem of of application developers and and you know and that's important in the same way that we with neuromorphic we we go outside with working hardware to understand what this might be good for we have to get to that point with quantum as well um, and we. At some level, we do that. I mean, we already have collaborations with uh, um, TU Delft and, and QTech. That that's the the way that we're we're collaborating with with university partners. Um, but uh, you know, I, I think we're we're still a ways away from from practization, and, and I won't offer a specific date. <laughs> 
Well, um, speaking speaking about that, you you say that uh, at the point where we you know get ready, we have to start speaking about millions of qubits. Um, Intel's third generation Tangle Lake quantum processor is currently at forty nine. Um, so does that mean we 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 should expect you know three, four, five more generations before we get you know before we hit that inception point where perhaps co- commercialization is more of a reality? Just to get those numbers up and the management. Yeah, to be clear, Tangle Lake would, was an example of the uh, the transmon um, superconducting qubit type um, that 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 we that you know we're, we're we've as I've explained earlier we've begun to, to deprioritize that um, and we're you know we're we really are looking at the spin qubits and in here where it's it's a. Uh, we're on a path to, you know, to increase the number there, but um, really, it's it, uh, you've got to get really quality uh, qubits uh, to begin with before you think about scaling larger numbers and solve these other problems around around control, and which we think I think we've made really great progress on that with with Horse Ridge. Report uh, earlier this year, late last year, saying that Google has achieved quantum supremacy. Do you believe we've achieved quantum supremacy? Yeah, uh, I mean they. By the definition of quantum supremacy, which is pick a problem um, that you can't solve with classical methods, but that's provably, you know, computationally complex, um, and, and and build a system that can, you know, that can solve that problem. Uh, it's it's you know they've achieved that that goal. Now, notice the problem doesn't have to be um, something that's useful, no. <laughs> you know, uh, that you would actually, you know, be a problem that that people need. Uh, at being solved, but but it's still, it's an it was a milestone, you know, in in the field, and and certainly it it, it was a, a a good thing to have achieved. Um, we the way we think about it is, when do we get to the point of having a practical solution that we're solving something that 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 people would care about and and that you can't solve, you know, in in other ways with classical methods more economically and and we're still far from that i don't think we've reached that 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 era of of quantum practicality as we call it should any engineers be listening excited about the topics how do they go about you know aligning their research to something that intel labs might accelerate and collaborate with or you know get involved with intel labs directly what is the process to do there Mm -hmm. well um for for those who are um Still, say in grad school, we have internship programs um, in a broad range of areas, and you can just check out our, our website and, and reach out to you know the researchers in, in different areas. Um, we, uh, as I explained earlier, we engage uh, uh, academia, um, universities in in you know the various areas that we're interested in, and and so it could very well be that your university has a program with Intel. We oftentimes stand up um, research centers in in different areas. Um, we have a number of those those kinds of programs, and um, that's the most natural way to get plugged into the the work that happens in the labs. And and then you'll be you know um, oftentimes the way our methodologies we directly work with with the researchers. We publish papers together with them. So even during your studies you can you can be, you know, working with Intel Labs folks. And then based on that experience, then it can develop into, you know, joining the labs in, in the future. Um, so that's you know, I think through through that internship program and through our, our academic funding, that's that's the most natural path for early career. Um, you know, if you're uh, Outside of school already, you know, then it's um, it's a matter of, of just uh, again, you know, reaching out to the um, the researchers in your area, and, and, it, and you can find that that kind of information from you know from our website. And uh, what about for anybody who thinks they have uh, they 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 have a corporate perhaps combined interest that they think both sides can mutually be beneficial from? Is that a little different? One of the things that we do is. Um, it's kind of a, a, an outgrowth of our academic investments. A lot of startups come out of academia, and we do have, together with Intel Capital, um, programs where we look at at um, startups coming out of universities that that are, are at that seed stage. You know, like they're at really at that beginning forming stage, and we um, we oftentimes know them because we funded their research. But we will look at at um, you know uh, with in, Intel Capital's uh, uh, support. Uh, uh, help them through that those early stages of the formation of the company. And we also look oftentimes not just for funding opportunities, but also ways that there might be technologies that could help uh, the, the startup to succeed. So, so we do have programs like that um, that you know that that present some opportunities. 
Um, for anybody who's watching and doesn't know what Intel Capital is, it's essentially Intel's uh, investment fund. They go out, they look at companies that they think are worth investing in, not only for the financial gain, but perhaps a, a nod to collaboration, improvement, maybe merger and acquisition, that sort of thing. Um, I went to one of Intel Labs events last year. It was amazing. Uh, I still need to do a, a write-up on it. I think when we get traveling again, we'll do that again. Um, but yeah, uh, on, on the Intel Labs side, um, what is the future for Intel Labs' public outreach in, this, you know, in the way that I'm interviewing you and we've got this Intel Labs Day coming up uh, for the press and the analysts. Is that Intel Labs Day going to become an annual occurrence or? I expect it will. You know, we, we want uh, to put a lot more energy into talking about our work out, outside the company. We did go through a period where, where we did less of that. If you look in our history, you know, um, going back a few years, we did more of it in the past, but we're, we, we, we do expect to do uh, more of this. We would have, uh, we, we were going to have a physical Intel Labs event at the beginning of the year when, uh, you know, the COVID struck, but, um, but we'll, you know, certainly um, be, be talking a lot more about our, our work um, in, into the future and, and do, you know, events like that. Um, uh, I, I certainly expect that to be the case. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you, Rich, for your time. Much appreciated. Thank you, Ian. I enjoyed the chat.